So I am opening my presentation, sharing my presentation. Okay, so, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, listener, listeners I'm... and uh, expert panel. I am opening my presentation. Just a minute, sir. Let Getting me go live. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good yeah. afternoon, listeners. This is the uh, first uh, of series uh, of our uh, uh, webinar related uh, to listeners uh, endoscopic uh, techniques. And uh, I welcome expert panel. As you can see, Dr. Rohidas, who hails from, I'll briefly be sharing about their uh, um, uh, biodata. Dr. Rohidas hails from Maharashtra, Kolapur area. He's the guy who somehow introduced these techniques way back in 2002 in India. And uh, subsequently, I followed in his footsteps, Dr. Day and uh, Abdul Halim from Malaysia, then followed him, and uh, Dr. Rajmani from Madroi, then followed and Pramod, Arun Banot, Monu Singh, and Malcolm Pestenji are all are well known names as far as spinal endoscopic uh, surgeries are concerned in India. And after years of uh, uh, experience and expertise, these uh, of my colleagues have made name in field of this uh, spine endoscopy. And uh, before we get into the presentation. And I'll also like to thank that today's, uh, uh, this webinar is, uh, has been possible by close association of World Endoscopic Spine Society in coordination with the Ortho TV, which is, uh, uh, I think, associated with the Orthopedic Research Group of uh, India. And uh, uh, I think Dr. Ashok has already shared with you about the rules I think uh, I'll not uh, need not go into the details. I'll like to save on time here. And uh, as we know, the philosophy of, uh, of these surgeons is that first do no harm and address the pathology without increasing the collateral damage. That is the basic philosophy of uh, MIS techniques where endoscopy also respects this principle. Preserve the posterior spine architect. Enhanced visualization is another advantage of endoscope because eye is inside. And surely it is associated with the less morbidity like pain, blood loss, infection, and faster return to work. And size of the incision, we do talk, but I think the inside work is more important than merely talking about a size of incision. So as I shared with you program slide, I will briefly now request Dr. Rohit Das to begin with his first presentation. And before he uh, starts his presentation on a topic, endoscopic, Minimal Invasive Spine Surgery Philosophy and Physics of Interdiamond Approach of Endoscopic Spine Surgery. I'll surely, I'll request him to have a three to four minutes comments about spine endoscopy. Over to Dr. Rohit Das. Mohinder, good afternoon. Let me share the screen and then while starting with my topic, I will talk about these basic things and what you want to, me in the introduction will be there. You are able to see the screen? Yeah, we can see. Yeah. Now yeah. this is a post-corona world. You have to learn these type of webinars. Now the live surgery demonstrations, cadaver workshops will be very few in 220 or 221. Big conferences also will not be there in 220. That is what I believe. I'll be talking about interlaminar approach, philosophy, and physics. In the history, you see, we have three names. One is Casper, other is Law, Loy, and Distandu. These are in the interlaminar approaches. We'll have to start with the Casper, but first I'll start with this 2000 conference. This was the conference which initiated my interest in endoscopic spine. That was in Lilawati, organized by Dr. Ramani. And at that time in India, it was the first time the internal laminar approach with endoscope 
was demonstrated but the irony was it was the distend use technique it was the endospine but using surgeon was dr john chu it was not dr distend there was lot of hype about this endoscopic thing because that was the first time it was demonstrated in india he operated three cases the surgery was quite good but all the three cases had csf leak okay and there was a wrong message to the delegates that it doesn't work still i continued with the the uh, uh, trying to get the knowledge about this interlaminar approach and in 2002 i went to dr distandu to learn this there was initially lot of resistance from others that these things are not going to work in this slide you just try to see this is one of the system by john chu this is a smart system it has a cubular retractor and endoscope now in interlaminar approach the basic is you need one endoscope one you you need one cubular retractor through which the working instruments go if the tubular retractor with the instruments move around it is mobile if the tubular retractor is fixed and in that you move this instruments it is the fixed one if it is a longer tube and still the endoscope and the tube moves around it is mobile other differentiation is whether you are using fluid or air in the tubular retractor so these are the two differences so just remember this slide because this was in 2002 the similar system was made by dr mazhar hussain from lucknow and he presented that in 2005 he used the proctoscope you can see this is a proctoscope there is a channel for endoscope and it hits at the lower end where the endoscope reaches to the outer tube so there is a endoscopic vision tubular retractor for instruments this is in 2002 i started my uh, training with neuroendoscopy and spinal endoscopy neuroendoscopy with parnesgi and spine with dr distandu and at in 2002 distandu mentioned look after about 20 30 years this is going to be the bread and butter because spine is going to remain same because all the other categories will have minimalism like in uh, aneurysms you have interventional radiology this is neuroendoscopy training at mains 2004 we did the first live demonstration in indore now we'll go to the basic again this is the tubular retractor mentioned by casper in 1977 and if you see this is the physics of the tubular retractor this is the width this is the length and this is the angle in between the two instruments because in the tubular retractor you can use two instruments now these are the tubular retractors mobile and fixed in mobile we have distend you satnam chabra and mohinder has modified it satnam chabra made the 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 cavity of the tubular retractor more wide for the mobility of the instruments mohinder has used a 30 degree scope instead of a 0 degree scope in fixed tubular retractor most popular nowadays is the easy go but we started with the matrix there is a smart tubular retractor and others now both these are air based mobile and fixed tubular retractors are air based in mobile the tubular retractor is mobile with instruments in the fix the instruments move inside the fixed tube in mobile it is a zero degree scope in fix it is the angle scope because the instruments go parallel to each other in mobile we can use routine instruments we have to use longer instruments with a bayonet angle in the fixed one the muscle is dissected from lamina and retracted in mobile you go through the muscle in the fixed system because you dilate it less chance of muscle intruding inside the tube because you separate the muscle in the mobile muscle intrudes inside the tube in fixed tubular retractor we have to cauterize it and remove it 
Now, other system is the fluid-based endoscopic system where you use a long tubular retractor, but it's a smaller diameter. It's a very small tube, same principle. Physics is same. You need fluid for creating space to work and this fluid retracts the tissue, the dural tube. As instruments and the endoscope are parallel to each other, you need an angled scope. You need to move the whole system together at the site of the pathology so as to cover the entire area of pathology. So the dissection at the level of the pathology is the same in spite of a small incision. You need instruments which can angle at the tip only. Very delicate instruments are necessary. Breakage and recurrent cost is always there. Only the entry point is small at the site of the pathology and same dissection as you have to use a conti continuous use of cautery RA for laser for hemostasis because it's a very small area. The water will help in washing the blood, but it will not have hemostasis. As the tubular retractor is longer, the maneuverability of the instruments from the top to the site of the pathology to the hands, there is colliding of the hand cell along with the water irrigation, which is continuously there. So this is the basics between the fix tubular detector and mobile, the air-based and the fluid-based. Now we'll go to the endoscopic instrument. This is with the distant use technique, very few instruments. These are the same instruments since 2002. The endoscope quality has changed. This is with the easy go, very, multi, very uh, uh, long and multiple instruments. This is with the metric system, multiple tubes. Now we have to Think of the physics, why they need multiple tubes in fixed tubular retractors. Now, basic in the tubular retractor is fixed tubular retractor has to touch the lamina or the mobile tubular retractor has to touch the lamina or facet. And the length of the tubular retractor has to be longer if the patient is obese. The movements of the instrument inside the tubular retractor are dictated geometrically by the diameter and length of the tubular retractor because the instruments move inside the fixed tube. Within the tubular retractor, Sanjar surgeon has to maneuver instruments with both the hands with an angle A. If you can go to the figure, you, you can appreciate that angle A. And this angle between the instrument changes with the width of the tubular retractor and also with the length of the tubular retractor. Now you can appreciate in this figure, this is a tubular retractor which is short. In, you can use it in thin patient. This is a longer tubular retractor for an obese patient. Usually the, the Americans and Europeans, they need a longer tubular retractor. Now this figure illustrates the principle that the shorter or wider tube allows surgeon better ability to maneuver the instruments during the operation. As the length of the tube increases or the width of the tube decreases, the angle that poor surgeon may use to operate within the tube decreases. It becomes acute. In obese patient, when the surgeon has to use longer tubular retractors, the same width as the shorter, shorter one, then the angle between the two instruments become acute and the handling of the instruments is difficult. Hence, there is a ten tendency to use wider and longer retractors. That's why they fix tubular retractor systems, they have multiple tubes. Another important reason is they had thought of instrumentation with the tubular retractor, fixed tubular retractor. That's why they have longer and wider tubes. Now in distant view, what happens in the endospine? As the outer and inner tube with the endoscope moves together, the angle between the endoscope and the instrument is 12 degrees, which remains constant. It is the natural angle when we use two instruments. In the microscopic surgery also, when we use two instruments, it is the same angle in between the two hands. Outer tube is locked, locked over the lamina, retracting the muscle, and the inner tube is retracting the skin edges. And you can change the length of these two. In obese patient, even if the outer and inner tube is buried inside the skin plane, the instrument approach the target due to the angle between the endoscope and the working channel remains the same. You can appreciate here, this is a thin patient from the lamina up to the skin. This is an obese patient from lamina up to the skin. The angle remains same. And through the working channel, your instrument goes in front of the lamina. 
you don't have to search for the tip of the instruments through the working channel it will go in front of the endoscope this is how you can mobile the move the endoscope so this is the difference between the fixed tubular retractor and mobile the physics of it the tip of the instruments and the angle of the endoscope now we'll go to the distant use technique now i am using it since 2002 3D endoscope since 2017. It is a air-based endoscopy and mobile. The only system can be used for all the pathologies, including the intradural as well. It is the cheapest instrument because there are very few instruments. This can be used for more than 100 to 100 surgeries. Breakage is very less. Only system that can be used with 3D endoscope. we have a paramedian incision after localization then we retract the muscle put this outer tube which retracts the muscle from the lamina this is the outer tube in place then we remove some soft tissue then we put this inner tube which creates artificial space in between the inner and outer tube we use a 0 degree scope and we can have a zoom effect in between the outer and inner tube in obese patient we can use a retractor like this and the whole tube can go inside this is what we get this is the anatomy is not foreign this is like open or like microscopy outer tube inner tube and the endoscope with light cable then suction in the left hand working instrument in the right hand and then we balance the whole system and move around you can use all the routine instruments and you can angle it in obese patient even if the whole system goes inside it doesn't matter this is in 2006 first workshop you can appreciate this is a 14 inch tv sony tv 0 degree scope single chip camera and this was the video at that time mohinder just let me know how the video is is okay reasonably okay okay and this is now in 2018 17 3d endoscope intra operative training and you can appreciate the size of the endoscope here this is the 3d endoscope by stross Uh, you can just appreciate the hand movements with the endoscope this was in 2004 the whole system moves together now this is localizing pin what we use this is for the neural foramen this is for the disc space and a representative case alpha s1 disc superiorly migrated on the right side right l5 lamina this is midline lateral cranial caudal we have made a window in the flywarm we use the cottonoid to push the dura anteriorly this is the traversing route superiorly migrated disc we are removing the disc this is the disc and then disc inside the disc space which is degenerated this is the traversing route completely decompressed route from the shoulder axilla going into the foramen after the discectomy it's a lax route same thing can be used for the far far lateral approach this is the isthmus we go through the neural foramen isthmus we remove part of the isthmus this is the exciting route this is the lateral edge of the dura and this is the huge far lateral disc in the axilla of the exciting route this is the decompressed exciting route now this is a representative tube case right sided l45 you can appreciate the lamina here this is the midline we use routine instruments like this is a 3 mm carison punch everything is under vision then we cottonite use cottonite to push the dura anteriorly this is to prevent complications like dural puncture and dural tear this is the second carison punch in the set we use to remove the ligamentum flam this is a 90 degree 3 mm carison punch
Then we decompress the traversing route here. This is extruded disc here. Lateral lesion we do are here. And this is the extruding disc. We are mobilizing the extruded disc and then we are removing it. Yes, that is the lateral edge of the dura traversing route. Then we retract the roots with the cottonoid and then we puncture the annulus through the... Uh, Rohidas, I am just pitching in how much more slides to go? Maybe around... I'll just make it fast. No, what I want is for next five minutes, now you now speak about complications part. Yeah, yeah. Let's... Okay, okay. Then we go inside the disk space and see whether we have missed any loose piece inside or not. I'll just share something with, about the stenosis. This same technique can be used for the stenosis. And we use carison punch to go up the, on the opposite side. We can use a drill. We can angulate and go on the opposite side. Both the side roots are decompressed. We can use this for multiple foraminotomies, and these are the multiple incisions. This is how we can use drill. This is a drill with the protection sheet to prevent the complications. We can use the ultrasonic bone dissector also because it is less traumatic to the neural structures. These are the bilateral roots. About the complications, you can have a dural puncture like this. You have to use cotton oil to prevent dural structures or neural structures coming into the carison punch. You have to use this nerve root retractor very carefully because you are using a mobile system. And in the initial stage, when there is a dural puncture, tear or leak, in the initial learning phase, it's a white tear converted into open. Dural puncture, you can use a muscle piece with gel foam. You can use a muscle piece with fibrin glue or tissue dura patch, or you can use anastoclips. This is the dural puncture, and you can use muscle piece And over this, we can put a tissue dura patch like this. You can use this system for interdural tumors also. And how I'll just show you how we can use the anastoclips. This is for wide dural tears. It's a watertight closure with 2 mm titanium clips. Everything is mentioned in this book. This is how we use the 3D endoscope. And this is how we use the 3D endoscope for intraoperative training. So the basic thing is in the interlaminar techniques, don't compare the incision in millimeters. This is for the transforaminal. This is for the interlaminar. What you do at the site of the pathology is very important. Now you will come to the same slide here. Now there is a technique Dr. Son will be talking about, about UBE. If you break this system, you will go to UBE. 
if you break this system you will go to ubu so the circle is completing again with this we started with the fixed interlaminar approach now we are coming with the mobile interlaminar where we can use two pores this is dr son so we are trying to find a gold standard the diamond standard is the patient has to be very happy surgeon has to be satisfied and you should be able to convince what you have done to the patient or relatives thank you thank you dr rahidas for a illustrative uh, presentation before i invite next speaker i'll uh, i welcome uh, dr son uh, and dr halim uh, who is from malaysia dr son is a very well known uh, figure as far as uh, ub technique is concerned he is the mastermind who has uh, designed this technique he has innovated instrumentation and this is a most uh, uh, endoscopic savvy technique nowadays more and more surgeons are showing interest in these techniques and they are visiting dr son even i had opportunity i along with dr rohidas and uh, dr pc day visited dr son for about say maybe week week or so and we were very much impressed with the type of work he was doing and uh, what we found was ki there was a further uh, apart from disc pathologies and uh, lumbar canal stenosis the envelope has been pushed further and we are doing now endoscopic fusions also endoscopic assisted fusions and that i think dr son will be briefly share, sharing in his presentation so welcome aboard dr son and uh, dr halim and now may i request dr pc day to speak on principles of endoscopic spine surgery i think principles as we know are very very important if we follow the principles i think mind will devise its own methods so i will again request that uh, dr day please uh, respect the time so that other speakers also get adequate time and main purpose will be the expert panel i want that we should have a good discussion among ourselves which i am sure will immensely benefit the listeners so dr so, uh, dr uh, pc day over to you i'll stop yeah. sharing my this thing screen yeah please Is okay. My slide is uh, uh, come. Yes. Slide is appearing now. Yes. Are you able to see my slide? You have to open the slide now. You have open the slide because your other files are also visible. Desktop, I think. So, a uh, slide show. Yeah, make it slide show, then we can see. Is okay then now. Double Double click on the uh, on the file. On your PPT file, just double click. We we are seeing the preview. We are not seeing the. So again, I am going to the. Yeah, please. Uh, first, open the PPT, then come back to the video panel. Is okay now? I think by the time he sets his video, may I call upon Dr. Son to get onto his presentation? If uh, you see, you are having some hiccups with the presentation. Let Let Dr. Son Son start. Yeah. Ah, uh, Dr. Son, I think we switch over to we go to Dr. Son over to South Korea. Is now okay? Yeah. Dr. Son, he will be uh speaking on uh, UBE basics. Uh, this is my this is my time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is your time. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, doctor, there we are. You we are seeing only the preview. How can uh, PC day should exit from the? Yeah, he can. I think is okay now. And do. Dr. PC Day, you will be speaking after Dr. Son now. So please close your presentation. Stop sh share screen. Dr. Day, I hope you understood what I am saying. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Son. Dr. 
Dr. Son, please. Okay. Yeah. Kaise is there? Hi, Kaise, how are you? Please wait a moment. Yeah. Sound any issues with the presentation? Can you open it, sir? You're trying to open the file now. Okay. Okay. For the rest of the speakers, open your presentation and keep that presentation ready. Yeah. Ready. Ready. Presentation ready. Open the. Do you guys have uh, any questions from expert panel to Dr. Rohidas by the time yes. uh, presentation? Dr. Rohidas, I have one question. Yeah. Where do you see the future of this technique vis-a-vis, -vis, I'm talking about interlamina versus transferaminal techniques. Dr. Lokhande is a person who is well versed with both of them. So the, 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 the future is now these people have changed to interlaminar. It means interlaminar approach is really necessary yes, if you want to tackle other pathologies. Yes, yes. So that has there is no, no doubt. They they had to change to the interlaminar approach. Do you see the files? Yes. So Dr. Pramod, yeah. you think? Dr. Son, yeah, I think uh, we discussed this later. Dr. Son, please start your presentation. Full slide share. Uh, sorry, slide show. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. We are still on slide show. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am from Korea, Dr. Son. My topic is UBE basics. This topic is just for UBE <laughs> beginners. Uh, you know that this ULBD is the basic technique for stenosis, uh, even microscope and endoscope. This one here, yeah, ipsilateral laminotomy, flabectomy, contralateral subgram plasty, flabectomy, and bilateral decompression. All paper, all textbook described the just bone working and flabectomy. But let's just think about the here, this side. Initial target point, first target and exposure is only bone, bone working and discectomy. But we think about this area, skin to paraspinal muscle here. We think this is only root for surgical approach. But I think this is very important for minimal invasiveness. And so many techniques, many different techniques depend on how to approach and make a working space. I divided the three groups. First, uh, incision, dissectional approach, open surgery, microsurgery. The second group, percutane tubular system. This is MED, the standard PID, PL, PSLD. But three, trans soft tissue, semi tubular approach, UBE. This one. You know that this open approach, I think the best surgery for just for neural decompression because of expandability and low limitation, but it's, uh, it, it, but it is the dis handicap destructive surgery. Second group, percutaneous tubular system, a relatively easy and minimal invasive system. It has a serial dilating tube and but I think some visual and emotional limitation. So some limited indication. This is MED system. This is a Roidas descent technique and PSA. Third group is a trans soft tissue semi-tubular system. Semi-tubular means this figure is UV system. Left hand take endoscope, light and instrument. This working portal here. Retractor make a rigid wall, the other side the free wall, soft wall. This one, 
soft <laughs> and rigid make a semi tubular system soft and free part just as just act as open surgery no limitation rigid and retractor as a tubular system it make minimal invasiveness i think no limited motional limitation also minimal invasiveness is my philosophy for spine surgery but it has some difficulty to make initial working space that is laminar exposure during, especially during beginner period. Today, I lectured how to make initial working space for beginners, this one. What is the initial working space? You can see here, this yellow area is the potential space between lamina and paraspine muscle containing fat tissue, connective tissue, and vessel. Sometimes the bone is far, but the size of space is different from each person, each level, sometimes degree of bone is far. I call, we call this is a sound space. This one, this, this area is initial working space above lamina. How to make easily this space? First, uh, scope and cis must penetrate the paraspine muscle completely. Second, sleeve up technique to help cis to be complete penetration. Third, some volumes of fluid and hydrostatic pressure to push away soft tissue lamina. Third, force UV retract to wide interfascular area. This means, this is my hand, the sleeve of technique. Hand is scope and cis. Close this one, soft this include first muscle. After sleeve of, your hand is free and you are working perfect. After complete penetration through soft tissue, scope has a clear and wide visual field and your job could be perfect. This one, this one, triangulation, working portal, and this is uh, only sliver of technique. Sliver of technique, this one only simple, this one. This instrument, soft tissue elevation style. And here, you know that uh, some patient has atrophied back pain, some patient bit side back, back muscles, this one. This one is a machine. You can see easily this time. Lamina. Some patient has a big muscles. Remember first orientation. Sometimes scope and instrument insert between area muscle. You must penetrate this using sleeve of technique this time. Finally, you can see this lamina. Second is irrigating fluid fat and hydrosphere You know that the, the fluid fat location is very important. This location is at surgeon head level, roughly skin to back, roughly 50 to 70 centimeter. 50 to 70 centimeter converted the millimeter mercury, optimal pressure 30 to 50 millimeter mercury. Remember, head, head surgeon's head level. Second, retractor importance. Retractor is draw the upper fascia laterally to make an initial working space. You know that multipedus is the assembly of a small muscle particle. This one, four, three, four, five. But this upper particle here inserted uh, the L3, this one, low particle here. This is, triangle, this is a multi-bit triangle. If you want to operate the L45 level, upper particle insert L3, low particle L4, this one multi -pedus. This one also retractor, this retractor draw the upper particle lateral here, lateral here. And finally, to wide initial working space. Finally, scope and cease 
can penetrate the soft tissue completely here. This one here, touch and detect this type of a particle, this one. Again, this one, retract the upper particle this time. This area, initial working space. You know that I saw many lectures that this concepts, first uh, fluid medium surgery, bipotal surgery, triangulation, semi-tubular system, one-end surgery, lens inside, lens to be movable and pivot movement. And I also many times lectured, I use zero degree, she is this time, and also, I recommend the two beginners, the pre-operative major X-ray MR reading is very important. Commonly, this one, AP lateral view, commonly we read this type, but on UV technique, I recommend this stuff, parallel this type, because here, this one, this is skin, this angle, this is uh, relatively, this angle, this, this is different. So I recommend you let this portion also APB also this type. This figure is just, just like the operating field. So this one I stand left side this time and marking here, here target initial target point to portal here. Initial target point this uh, low one third here lamina above lamina. And also this one major important here, this one skin point and this one, this line is a medial wall of pedicle and here target point here, but this, this one, I measured the preoperative MRI here, this time, a depth and this angles. So yeah. in depth and angle is important to beginners. So the finally, the, this is simple surgical step for central center. Step one, two is the definite, the critical, Difficulty to beginners, but step three to seven is similar to open surgery, other, other techniques. First, the skin point here, this one with spinal support midline and the two point apart from each other, three centimeter here, above lamina, one third here, depth also here. This one here, initial target point here, serial dilation and detach and insert this type. This is triangulation. So for example, okay, this is example for central stenosis. This stenosis is a relatively narrow lamina and relatively vertical angle. And here, bone spur. Sometimes it, it's possible to miss the orientation and joint violation and damage parasite muscle. At that time, remember, initial target point is important. Initial target point is junctional area between spinal process and lamina. And only, only surgical step is to drill out base of spinal process, base of spinal process here. And finally, post-operative, you can see full decompression. So, so many spine surgeons and orthopedics, so most orthopedics can do the arthroscopy. So I will compare the, the arthroscopy. Commonly we say, we think about, oh, I am spine surgeon, I can do the arthroscopy. Also, I can, use, I can do UV, I think difficult. So I will compare to the arthroscopy, UV in the arthroscopy here, Pre existing space on earth, you be no space, but here joint space. So you be need to initial working space. Sonja space, this is a potential space, change to initial working space. Space character, this one, joint space capsule, but there is no without world, without world. That is open space, is important concept. Hydrospressure, important. This one. Also, depth is small. The widest is small, but depth is also deep. How to overcome depth is also important. Second, working space here. Again, I summarize here after detaching soft tissue lamina and 
insert the endoscope, hydrous pressure, push away. Finally, you can see here, this one. No, no. Here, this is the initial working space. This is the initial working space here. Second, step three, true working space midline cleft. That means here, after making initial working space here, you must drill a first base of sequence here. This one, this area, after drilling site is the true working space here. This area is a midline base of spinal process here. Very wide, very clear space. This is a true working space. After then, you must drilling go cranial site. This is a very small area. So sometimes sometime you miss orientation. So you must check at first midline cleft here. You can see here midline cleft. After finding out midline cleft, if she lateral laminotomy here, if, if she lateral laminotomy, flabectomy, contralateral subraminal plastis, simple. This procedure is simple and the same as the other techniques. Finally, you can if she lateral flabectomy here. Contralateral problem here, but slightly commonly you use remove the ligament problem Garrison longer. But I, I some I my technique is just elevation this time, elevation, elevation. I commonly use the branded retractor to prevent dural tear. Here, this one, this one bleeding control and this one contralateral controls. Here, contralateral, ipsilateral. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Son, for a uh, uh, very enlightening talk on UBE basics. I think once you know the basics and the principle, I think graduation to more and more advanced procedure is then an easy road. And I think Dr. Sohn has very ably covered his uh, technique about basics. Is the Dr. Arunubhanot on uh, uh, panel with us? He was also part of the expert panel. Has he joined? Uh, I don't know. So I think Dr. PC Day, are you ready with your presentation? Dr. PC Day, please, if you are ready with your presentation, please. Start. Go ahead. And Dr. Son, you have to stop your uh, screen share. Dr. Uh, Son, Rajmani and Rohidas, will you please uh, uh, mute your mic? And uh, Dr. Day, are you ready with your presentation? Yeah. Yes. Good. Please go ahead. I think we will have discussion in the end. Let the presenters finish their presentations. Then we will have a panel discussion. Dr. PC, we are no, you are not audible. Yeah, now? Is yeah, okay? please start speaking. Time is running out. Okay, so my slide is visible? Yes. Okay, so this is just a little bit about the interlaminar again endoscopic spine surgery. Why I prefer this technique for the disc herniation and canal stenosis, right?
talking about principles also yeah this is the uh, why it is not a uh, no more is a cosmetic surgery because of this uh, i don't know this my slide how it is wrong okay you can what problem you are facing uh, how to uh, proceed with the slides the principle is the same for the open surgery microscopic surgery and micro endoscopic surgery or whatever may the surgery this endoscopic surgery also the same principle we follow that is but in the endoscopic technique sufficient work done with the spinal canal and its neighboring structure under the excellent visual conditions not cutting the tissue but preservation of the tissue preservation of the epidural lubricating tissue reduces the epidural scarring and the avoidance of the post discectomy syndrome technology is evolving indications are expanding and growing so possible in obese osteoporosis multiple level hard central disc bilateral disc extruded and migrated upward downward that foraminal extra funal everything shown by dr rohidas complication like rural tear and the nerve root injury and infection are very very less because you are not going inside the hand is not going inside and the magnified view well illuminated view and complication following the dural tear the do dural tear is very very less here even the complication following the dural tear is very less because the, there will be no dead space after removal of the tube the all tissue fall into the space and the csm leakage will be less and the pseudo meningocele etc will be less there will be no fixation is required even in the multiple level and there is no adjacentable pathology that's why no increase in the morbidity in concurrent illness and advances in age and then the short hospitalization rapid rehabilitation high rate of return to the easily earlier level of the activity matching the result sometimes even surpasses the result to the open surgery and the micro surgery so this is the no more a cosmetic surgery rather it's indispensable nowadays because the senior most surgeon to the young budding surgeon everybody prefer miss younger are the learning faster nobody could escape from the miss nowadays because this is the argument was that that that, that is advantages disadvantages everything skepticism comments everything now shut down because of the result there everybody is receiving the result and the high patient acceptance cost is less there is no implant no hospital minimal hospital. rajmani please put yourself on mute mode and now the people demand miss that is the most important thing the public is demand miss they are coming for the miss demand all these things all discussed the 12 degree angulation and the locking system and we are putting the patient in the knee chest position and then the cr on the lateral view there is no need of the ap view here and we are just uh, <clears throat> you can see the video we are just putting a special localizing device the two bars should be parallel to each other and parallel to the d space and then this is the interlaminar window approach very few instruments press fit technique there is no special in, uh, device to fix it both the hand of the surgeons are free left hand for the suction tip right hand for the instrument and in the left approach the monitor will be in the cranial end you are sitting the surgeon is standing at the left side of the surgeon the top will be the 12 o'clock position of the midline and the left side will be the or at 9 o'clock position will be the cranial end 3 o'clock will be the caudal end in the right side it is just reverse if they were putting the standing the patient uh, in the knee chest position surgeon is standing in the right side of the patient and the monitor and the uh, tower will be in the caudal end and and the surgery in the orientation the right side or 3 o'clock position will be the cranial line the incision is very small it is about 15 to 18 mm long and 5 to 10 mm away from the midline even it little later a uh, little lateral if you are going to uh, address the stenosis bilateral one it is very small incision and you have to cut the fascia in the same line of incision then dissect sub periosteally from the spinous process laterally so whole set of the muscle is uh, sub periosteally dissected without disturbing the nerve supply and the uh, muscle sub uh, neural uh, nerve supply and the vascular supply and there is a sub tissue retraction with the sub gauze piece tied with the thread now come to the uh, mobility we have already discussed there is a example of 52 years lady with the uh, adjacent level pathology after the fixation of 6 years she came to me with the disc herniation at l5 s1 4 5 is fixed and huge disc right side to radiculopathy right side was more and this is the visualization and this is the uh, 
video you can see this is a very short video with the right side approach l5 h1 the superior lamina is in the in the at uh, cranial end is at three o'clock position this is the cranial and this is 12 o'clock position is the midline and nine o'clock position is the caudal end the first bite at the spinal lamina junction and then gradually we are coming laterally up to the facet cutting three to four millimeter of the bone to detach the yellow ligament or ligamentum plavum gradually from midline to lateral with the 45 degree three mm carison punch and now the ligamentum plavum or yellow ligament is detached from the superior lamina here and the then gradually you are coming up to the facet that is lateral and this is your inferior facet or s1 facet this is l5 s1 level the surgery uh, the uh, small gauzebeach tied to trade or you can say use the neuropathy to protect the uh, dura and the nerve tissue here neural tissue here the thick end ligamentum plavum patient is 52 years and already one level surgery done fixation at l4 l5 one level above so thick end ligamentum plavum and this area is literally is the facet hypertrophic little bit you have to cut the facet at the medial end and decompress the nerve root and the hypertrophic part of the ligamentum plavum and here we are just cutting the ligamentum plavum uh, laterally on the facet and the nerve root is, will be in front of you this is the nerve root and this is the dura in between there is a huge disc huge disc at l5 h1 it is a right side my pen filter is just uh, it, it, it is a little bit adherent. I am trying to detach the the extruded part of the disc, which was at the axilla. And nerve root will be nerve root is here, dura is here, and this is a huge disc at the axilla. And we are trying to remove the huge part of the disc, extruded disc, and little bit migrated downward. So after removal of that uh, disc, we searched for the any uh, small uh, left out. And then we try to go to the disc space to find out any soft or free fragment left out in the disc space. And then irrigation with the normal saline. And this is the end of the surgery. So the same patient, after four hours of the surgery, after recovery from the anesthesia, huge amount of the disc removed and comfortable. So this is the how we are tackling with epidural bleeding, maybe bipolar cautery, the set is coming in the set, sometimes surgical, cell, sometimes the uh, bone wax for the bone bleeding and the dural tear already discussed in detail for, I just wanted to show you how you, most of the time it is very small, most of the time. And if it is a herniation of the nerve root, and then you need to put a small muscle page or then surgery cell. If it is a no, no, nerve root herniation on his surgery cell is enough. No, no, to, no need to put the muscles or something. Now, if it is a three level disc, then you have to approach from the four, five, five S1 can be approached from the single port like this, tilt a little bit upward and downward. And if it is a three, four, four, five, five S1, then add a separate port for the L4, L5. If it is a sometime, three level also we are doing at a three separate port if the patient is very tall and the come to the uh, recurrent herniation after the recurrence everybody knows sorry for the uh, inter major problem for the revision surgery the limited visualization that is the most problem most of the critical problem so restricted handling of the neural structures is insufficient visual field leads to sometimes the dural tear and the nerve root injury so therefore the wider decompression everybody in the mindset of that open surgery is far better for the revision surgery and open surgery will give you the wide visualization so that you can save the nerve. But at the same time, you have to compromise of the stability and may leads to the fixation or fusion is necessary. So thought of the endoscopic technique, that clear differentiation of the neural structure from the scar tissue, adhesiolysis performed while preserving the stability and the remnant facet joint would lower the risk of complication. And importantly, we would avoid the unnecessary fusion surgery. So, the view is not like microscopic, it is a panoramic view. So we can see all corners at the same time, the deeper dissection along with the bony surfaces from the facet to the base of the pedicle could easily uh, perform. This is a patient of 62 years lady, undergone open laminectomy and the nerve root decompression, L4, L5 and L5H1 lumbar canal stenosis in 2012. 
and there was a pain persisting and crippling type of pain people advised for the instrumentation stabilization and then the epidural nerve block in 2015 gives temporary relief and 2016 june she landed in bhubaneswar with a quite wide laminectomy you can see the wide laminectomy and after that uh, we did the mri and contrast mri you find out there is a l4 l5 right side disc herniation this recurrence of the disc and then we thought about the uh, endoscopic technique this is the way we are dealing with because there was no lamina we direct, directly dug the instrument on the facet and then cutting the facet we have to first discriminate between the bone and the soft tissue and then sacrifice some of the bone or the medial aspect of the facet so that we will give a clear edge between the soft tissue or the fibrous tissue here then use the nerve root tractor and retract the fibrous tissue medially go directly below the nerve root and remove the disc so this is the beauty of this technique you have to you can see the magnified view well in front of you nerve will be in front of you and just got little bit of medial aspect of the facet and then you will get a cleavage between the facet and then the uh, sub tissue or the fibrous tissue so this is the patient after the surgery now come to the over the top decompression or lumbar canal stenosis this is the uh, pathology please, i'll here. request you to conclude please conclude and stick to the principles please another another 2 minutes here yeah. this is the principle that is the central canal stenosis lateral stenosis foraminal extra foraminal and uh, this is the way we are going from one side to the opposite side so unilateral laminotomy and bilateral decompression remove the lesion without disturbing the anatomy and stability and preserving the motion and function this is the beauty of this technique indication everybody knows i am not going to detail but the foraminal stenosis degenerative spondylolisthesis like grade 1 multidirectional rotational even the multiple level stenosis with uh, post radiation stenosis obesity coda you can everything can be dealt with we do the laminotomy and the not laminectomy there is example here how to go to the opposite side this is the way we are going to the this is the same side it's a uh, left approach so discectomy and the decompression of the same side then we are going to the opposite side putting the putting the uh, one neuropathy just at the midline to protect the neural tissue and then undercutting the lamina undercutting the spinous process of the opposite side and cutting the hypertrophic part of the facet and cutting the ligamentum flammarum hypertrophic part decompress up to the foramen and nerve root decompression at the opposite side or contralateral side here it is the right side and left approach so the left side at 9 o'clock position is the cranial and right side 3 o'clock position is the caudal and this is the opposite side disc also we can visualize and then you can see this is the opposite nerve root decompressed up to the foramen and this is the same side nerve root that decompressed up to the foramen so this is the another patient at l4 l5 disc and also stenosis there is a huge uh five hard disk here hard disk in the right side and this is the video i just wanted to show you one uh, 20 second small video this is the same side and this is the opposite side hard disk and we are just removing the opposite side hard disk this is the beauty to see the same side and opposite side both the interlaminar window at the same time and then this is the irrigation with the normal saline you can see the flow from left to right and right to left so this is the beauty of this uh, technique this is the patient is walking on the next day morning who has almost uh, bedridden for months and this is the so contralateral visualization of the lateral ischias and foramen are vast superior during the contralateral decompression of the carison fence protects your nerve root and dura therefore the contralateral decompression lateral ischias foramen can be performed more easily safely in this technique even the adjacent level pathology like fixation after the 455 h1 so the 3445 there were two level above and one level below that stenosis patient was trying for the surgery beg for the surgery because of the coda equina syndrome after 2 years we operated all two level above and one level below the fixation with this technique and the next day morning patient was very happy pain was uh, almost uh, gone sorry for the slight movement one second this is the patient in the next day morning and the another patient 92 years uh, main uh, admitted in Dr. the cd please conclude yeah. you are eating up by the time of other speakers you are eating just my time i am just finishing within 20 second 
So this is the last slide and uh, three, four level stenosis. And this is the summarized, the 16 to 18 millimeter incision, 20 to 30 minutes uh, uh, level, uh, only one level surgery and mobile operating tube, less collateral muscle damage, less damage to the neuromuscular, neurovascular supply. So discharge on the same day of the surgery, multiple level stenosis could easily be performed with this technique. Le proper learning curve is more and more important. Proper learning, regular updating, dedication to the subject, regular discussions to the teachers, failures, complications, to choose the first sample case, then you go to the deep case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. P.C. Day, uh, for finishing little... Jai Jagannath. Jumping your time, not to worry. Now, I think uh, uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Monu. I think, Monu, your talk yes, is sir. very, very important for the beginners. Approaching... So approaching your first case. So yes, I'll re just request you to be crisp and give a clear message so that uh, youngsters, they know that how they have to start endoscopic spine practice in their uh, uh, career. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a very short talk. And basically this talk, I'm going to be just talking about stuff which I faced in my initial cases and a lot of help I had taken from my seniors, including you, sir. So, uh, I'm going to start with my talk. Let's share screen. I just, it is. Yeah, Dr. Mooney, you're facing any issues? No, no, no. It is asking for system preferences. And uh, are we, uh, is my screen available, uh, visible now? Not yet. It will come in a minute. Have you shared the screen? Yeah. There now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. You can just so, play it. Uh, Play it. Yeah. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, these are very few slides, and I will just take five minutes for this presentation. I'm going to be talking about basically stuff which I faced in my initial few cases. So, um, when we talk about, even though when we talk about this endoscopic discectomy by whichever means, whether it is microendoscopic, whether it is uh, tubular, whether it is uh, uh, distendu or any other system. Uh, yeah, for that matter. There is a certain amount of learning curve which is involved in getting to know this, these techniques uh, properly and to be able to deliver the desired results to the patient. Now, this learning curve by no means is a small one. You need at least 70 to 100 cases to be able to reach that uh, level of uh, proficiency. So, uh, Success, as we measure it with the patient satisfaction, there are four vital corners to this success. That uh, 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 is what I feel. You need to be absolutely sure about your pre-op preparation. When you're operating, the whole thing depends on how good your visualization is. You have to use a technique which is well worked. You should be uh, uh, very much aware of all the uh, 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 pearls, the tapes, the tricks, which are there. And of course, you must keep your ego in check so that you should revise, you should review your cases, you should revise those uh, uh, preparations, and you should be able to come out on top in subsequent cases. So when we talk of pre-op preparation, you have to be able to choose the right kind of patient. So that initially, my request would be for the people who start with these cases that go in for patients who are uh, having symptoms of root irritation, which are unilateral, preferably L4-5 and left-sided, assuming that we are right-handed. And there is a reason. I will just show uh, two small clips for this. So a thin patient with the unilateral sim uh, symptoms of root irritation, preferably on the uh, uh, left side in an L4-5 uh, uh, space, would be an appropriate patient for you to pick up initially. Now, this... Uh, is a, a short video. Now, when you're, if you're right-handed, 
what happens in a right sided approach your instruments get crowded as you can make out it is easier to operate on the left side of the patient than on the right side because the instruments get crowded on the right side this set is intended for right handed people so to start with stick to left sided patients do a few of those patients on the with herniations on the left side so that you pick up the technique proper go on to the right side after that positioning a uh, lot of people are doing knee chest position for the simple reason that uh, it is not a very a long procedure in their hand it takes hardly about 25 to 30 minutes for them to finish everything but but for people who are starting even if they are neurosurgeons even if they are used to working through a tube when you are starting with this mobile distendo sleeve it is preferable at least i think so to use a prone position why because a knee chest position for a longer duration the time taken initially will be longer it might not be a good uh, thing for the patient so a prone position in in any case is not a contraindication one should be uh, uh, using this position to start with and as your time limit goes down you can go on to the knee chest position identification of level now whatever level that we are operating on one has to be absolutely sure about that level because you are going in through a small incision you are reaching a particular level and you are decompressing that but you have to know that the level you have chosen to decompress is perfect or not most often than not it is the l45 and l5s1 these are the two levels where one can end up having a wrong level uh, decompression why because as you can see on this slide uh, both the starting position on the skin for an l45 and l5 s1 and as uh, other speakers have almost also shown that they are very close together you can tilt your instrument to decompress l45 and l5 s1 both from a single incision but that also means that any amount of little inclination which happens in it advertently during the surgery can take you to a wrong level so do not hesitate in making sure that level that you are working on is the correct level take a couple of pictures during the course of the procedure most importantly visualization now if you see something like this this is a red out this is a nightmare this means the surgeon has not taken due care to start this procedure something somewhere has gone wrong this kind of a field you cannot operate at all what you require is an absolutely clean bloodless field of surgery and for that for that there are certain precautions there are certain things that you are supposed to take take you have to make sure that your patient is not suffering from any kind of preoperative uh, for uh, any kind of coagulopathy make sure that the uh, blood profile is normal ask your anesthesiologist for a hypotensive anesthesia keep your head level a little lower down than operative level there should absolutely be no pressure on abdomen and importantly three three important steps number one you infiltrate pre op one ampule of adrenaline 200 ml ml of normal saline you use that infiltration along with your needle go and hit the spinal lamina junction go on to the spine the uh, lamina the medial part and infiltrate over there infiltrate over the facet joints and once you do that there would be much less troublesome bleed or ooze and once you start with the procedure just place three small uh, uh, gauze patties into the cranial caudal and the lateral aspect that will keep your tissues away that will also prevent any ooze from those uh, uh, tissues into the working pocket keep your working cannula a little short your working channel a little short of the cannula tip just so that your scope does not get uh, you know uh, the scope should not be smeared of blood because it's very difficult to keep cleaning it again and again second problem is that of a soft tissue uh, encroachment into the uh, 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 working field so for that a simple thing is that you should just coagulate the tissues which come into your cannula to initially only once you place your uh, uh, cannula the working sleeve just clean out the tissues and coagulate them it's very simple before you put in your working sleeve now these are the basic of uh, five instruments where you have to be careful using when you're using your uh, 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 when you're separating the soft tissues from the lamina 
then you have to be sure in using this instrument so that you do not end up creating a fracture of the osteoporotic bone. The two uh, rongers that we have, the different angulation of the rongers, be sure to use them when in, in particular manner, when you're close to the dura and the nerve roots, use the 90 degrees. Do not use the 60 degrees. The 60 degrees is to be used when you're taking out the bone. Use your uh, uh, tissue dissector. Use it to dissect out the median raphe so that you are able to remove the ligamentum clavum uh, nicely and not uh, plucking at it. And use your fenestrator or annulotome to open up the disc space to start with. This way, you are less likely to cause any injuries to the surrounding tissue. If you have a dural sac injury, be prepared. Be prepared with the duro seal, with your uh, uh, surgery cell. If not, then just use a muscle graft, but you have to avoid any kind of root injury. Be very cautious when you're using a root retractor, because the moment you use a root retractor, the whole system becomes a, a, a non-mobile system, and then you cannot push your root too much. If at all, at, all, at any point, you are stuck, then simply do not hesitate. Take out the system, convert it into an open procedure. Do not let your ego take over you. And most importantly, for each and every procedure, record, record, and review, review, revise, and get better. Still, if you do feel that there are issues which need to be taken care of, these are four centers where you can feel free to come, to interact, to observe, to learn, and to go back, and then come back and uh, discuss again. There are a lot of resources which are available over the net. They are to be used. So uh, I don't think there is any uh, uh, point in uh, hesitating in today's environment. So that is about all. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monu, for a very brief and uh, educative talk for youngsters, especially. And now may I call upon Dr. Pramod. I think Pramod is a uh, uh, a colleague who is master in transformaneic and he's also master in a new technique which is a full endoscopic technique and interlaminar technique. I think he is a guy who knows how to strike a balance where transformaneic will be a better choice for a patient or interlaminar and we got to take uh, learning from him that transformaneic is also a uh, in thing in uh, present times and we are, in, of course, this uh, seminar is uh, dedicated to only interlaminar technique. In proceeding seminars, we will be talking about transformanic also. So I think uh, Dr. over to Dr. Pramod. He will be sp speaking on full endoscopic interlaminar approach. Dr. Pramod, please. Uh, hello, Dr. Song. How are you? Uh, well, at the outset, I would like to say that, uh, first of all, any spine surgery, it cannot be, uh, you know, entirely tackled with one particular approach. Like uh, when you're doing open surgery, it has always been interlaminar approach first, but later on we started with the Wiltshire approach. Similarly, uh, I think regarding full endoscopy, it started uh, inversely, it started with the transforaminal approach. But we came to know that it is it has got very limited indications. And then we ultimately, we had to adopt the interlaminar approach. So the spine, to treat the spinal pathologies in general, we have to use both the windows together. We have to use the interlaminar window as well as the transforaminal window. And this applies to all the techniques, no matter whether it's distando, whether it's uh, full endoscopy, whether it's arthrospine, or whether it's UBE. So let me begin my talk on full endoscopic interlaminar approach for central and lateral risk stenosis. So if you look at the- uh, Dr. Pramod, can I stop here for a minute? Hello. Uh, yeah. We can see your color panel open on the screen. Uh, which one? Uh, there is a color selection panel on the screen that is open up. Let me check. Let me check. Uh, just minimize this presentation. You'll find it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. How is it now? Yeah, it's, it's nice now. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so if you look at the evolution of minimally invasive spine surgery, the entire focus uh, towards the development of the technique has been to minimize the access-related injuries. 
that is to minimize the soft tissue injuries and to minimize the amount of bone which is resected to access the pathology whereas the rest of the treatment is the same the rest uh, rest of the technique remains the same so full endoscopic interlaminar approach i think it is it lies at one of the top ends at the, the of this evolution and one of the ad added advantage of this technique is the use of irrigation fluid so this irrigation channel endoscopy it has really actually you know uh, revolution revolutionize the entire technique the fluid it washes out all the debris and removes all the bony debris and the soft tissues and the blood clots which are lying around and the field of vision is always very very clear the second advantage is that of the lower chances of infection because of the continuous irrigation of uh, irrigation channel uh, fluid i think the incidence of infection is hardly ever i have not seen a single case of infection in last like 15 or 16 years of my a practice of full endoscopic spine surgery so as i told you before no technique is stand alone we always have to use both the windows the interlaminar window as well as the neural foraminal window or the transforaminal window so each of them they have their own advantages disadvantages and limitations so when we come to lumbar canal stenosis i think central and lateral recess stenosis is the best way uh, treated by the interlaminar approach whereas for foraminal decompression it is always the transforaminal approach you cannot decompress a foraminal or an extra foraminal zone by using an interlaminar approach unless you violate the facet there are some surgeons who are using a transforaminal approach to decompress the lateral recess of the uh, stenosis but this is again a very debat debatable subject and uh, we can go hours on that so the uh, the technique is very very simple and it begins with the docking of the working channel for this you have to identify the interlaminar space the center of the interlaminar space is identified you take an 8 mm incision there you insert the dilator inside till it reaches at the level of the facet on the surface of the ligamentum pavum we check in the ap and the lateral views then you insert the working channel on top of it confirm the position after removal of the dilator the endoscope can directly uh, be inserted through this working channel so this requires hardly any imaging uh, during the surgery so this is how you handle the endoscope uh, and the use of the instruments through the endoscope the it has it is a your portal. voice is not uh, audible yeah. hello yeah so it's a unipotal uh, technique where the working channel lies inside the endoscope itself and only one single instrument can go through the endoscope at one time and this is the position of the video endoscopic trolley so the first step obviously is some amount of muscle and adipose tissue has to be removed to expose all the bony margins from all the sides you have to expose the superior lamina inferior lamina and laterally the facet joint so you identify the next step is to identify the tip of the descending facet or the inferior uh, articular process of the superior vertebra so this is the tip i am detaching the super attachment of the superficial part of the ligamentum pivum from the medial margin of the descending facet so this is the tip of the descending facet this is the descending facet this is the ligamentum pivum this is the ascending facet here and from here you start the drilling like this so this is how you start the tip go along the medial margin like this to reach the superior lamina and the extent of the proximal extent of the decompression is always till you reach the tip of the ascending facet so this is the tip of the ascending facet which i'm trying to do you have to keep on drilling till you reach the, actually visualize the tip there you can see the tip is there so that's the tip there and this is the curve which this is the medial margin of the ascending facet once that is done you start from the tip go downwards towards the inferior lamina start drilling the medial margin of the ascending facet so this is the drilling of the medial margin of the ascending facet now i am looking downwards you can see the endoscope can be tilted and angulated just like your head so you can look inferiorly you can look superiorly laterally or medially so this is the cutting of the medial margin of the ascending facet so once that is done you have to go to the inferior margin so this completes the bony resection once the bony resection is completed 
you start the ipsilateral decompression. You see the endoscope is vertical in this. This is the position of the endoscope. And you do it by cutting the ligamentum phloem layer by layer till you reach the epidural space and remove the rest of the uh, phloem along with the thinned out laminae uh, with the help of a kerosene punch like this. So you can see that there is hardly any bleeding there and hardly any debris which is uh, affecting the vision. The vision is very, very clear and this really reduces the chances of neural injuries or other kinds of complications. So once the ipsilateral decompression is completed, you uh, tilt the endoscope on the opposite side like this. This is the tilting of the endoscope. You pass the endoscope under the opposite lamina, over the dura, under the ligamentum phloem, and you start resecting the ligamentum phloem from the uh, undersurface. This is the contralateral facet which I'm drilling. It is initially thinned out, and the aim is to try identify the lateral border of the contralateral nerve root. So uh, the thinned out facet is removed with the kerosene patch. And this is the opposite nerve root, the lateral border. This is the axilla of the opposite nerve root. There you can see it. everything is seen very, very, very clearly. And once the decompression is completed, you can visualize the entire dura. And this is the ipsilateral nerve root. This is the dural side. So what is the extent of decompression? I think superiorly, it, uh, as we discussed earlier, it is from the tip of the ascending facet and inferiorly it is up to the middle of the inferior pedicle. So this is again a short video of contralateral decompression, decompression of the contralateral nerve root. A very hypertrophied ligamentum phloem is removed and the bone is exposed. The hypertrophied facet is drilled under very high magnification. You see that the tip of the instruments always visualize all the time. So the incidence of neural injury are absolutely negligent. So the thinned out facet again is removed with the help of a carison punch till you visualize the lateral border of the opposite nerve, uh, nerve root. So it is always from the uh, uh, lateral border of the nerve root to the lateral border of ipsilateral nerve root. You don't have to remove the facet right flush to the medial margin of the pedicle most of the times. So even if you expose the nerve root, see the lateral border of the nerve root very well. And that, is, that indicates that nerve root has to be mobilized completely like this. And this indicates complete contralateral decompression. This is the dural sac and this is the ipsilateral nerve root here. So all this has been done through an 10, uh, 8 or 10 millimeter incision, depending on the kind of endoscope you use. If you use an interlaminar uh, endoscope, we use an 8 millimeter incision. If you use a stenosiscope, it is a 10 millimeter incision. And uh, no drain is kept. The patient can be discharged immediately in the evening or next morning. So here are a few examples, a very severe central stenosis. And uh, we, uh, we used a right-sided approach for this patient. And you can see the amount of decompression that we get uh, in the post-operative MRI and the post-operative CT scan. Another case, a two-level stenosis, L45 and L5S1. You can see the post-operative imaging. This is done immediately after a couple of hours. You can see a small amount of hematoma there. But uh, this, is the, this is the air pocket there. And you can see how well the space is expanded. And this is the post-operative. CT scan. Another case, preoperative lateral recess stenosis, hypertrophic phloem, and you see the postoperative widening of the spinal canal. This is another case of lateral recess stenosis, preoperative and the postoperative images. So this is a management strategy for stenosis. If it is a lateral recess stenosis with a unilateral symptoms, I usually uh, do a unilateral decompression with or without discectomy. If it is needed, we do, do the discectomy. And bilateral symptoms, uh, having lateral recess stenosis or a central uh, stenosis. Here, if there is a no disc or, or if there is a unilateral disc, then I always do the ULBD procedure, which is unilateral approach, bilateral decompression. But sometimes you can see that the patient has radicular pain on one side. And on the MRI, the, uh, it, the disc herniation can be on the opposite side. Or sometimes there is a broad-based disc herniation, which I think it is not possible for you to remove only from the ipsilateral side. So in that case, I use a bilateral approach to a single incision, but two different facial incisions. You have to cut the lumbar fascia at two different places. 
and this bilateral decompression with a single incision is a good way to tackle contralateral leg pain so here are a few uh, you know cases we have almost an experience of more than 124 cases and in the initial uh, stages our uh, problem was even though the patient was symptomatically completely free of symptoms we uh, radiologically we were not very happy and this is because we were not uh, extending in uh, uh, the area of decompression from the tip of the ascending facet to the middle of the uh, pedicle inferiorly so when we started following that and in the initial stage, uh, stages we used to check the decompression intraoperatively uh, on the mri pictures lateral uh, on the cm pictures the lateral cm pictures but later on with experience we uh, we were able to do that comfortably and we didn't need intraoperative cms uh, during all my cases i think i have got uh, two or at the most three cases of dural tears and they were completely asymptomatic one two cases were detected post operatively when i did an mri post operative and you can see a small uh, casf uh, you know, fluid collection here in the subcutaneous region and uh, the patient was absolutely asymptomatic and treated the same way like any other uh, endoscopic surgery patient uh in the first few cases again i used to use a rubber cap on the endoscope and i used to use a arthro pump to increase the fluid pressure but uh, we had the experience of the patient having some kind of heaviness in the legs post operatively and a little bit of difficulty in walking and this used to disappear after a couple of uh, you know weeks or so but once we shifted on to the open system we stopped using the rubber caps and we started using gravity assisted irrigation then uh, i think uh, the symptoms this kind of problems were not seen during a uh, treatment so to summarize i think all the technically uh, demanding this is a very safe and effective procedure the clinical outcomes are equal to that of conventional decompression so no matter what technique you are using you are doing doing an open microdiscectomy or a laminectomy or destandu technique or arthrospine or whatever the results are comparable it depends on how well the surgeon is executing the technique not the per se the technique itself uh, so the results have to be comparable but we have all the advantages of mis surgeries that we have less access related tissue injury the less hospital stay less post operative pain and early return to work and uh, uh, i've uh, re uh, revised a couple of cases in my practice like the patients who were operated like 3 or 4 years back i came uh, with a similar complaint again and that was because of restenosis but uh, during the re exposure of that particular area during the revision of that particular area we found it that it was like a virgin field and we had absolutely no problem going through ligamentum clavum and uh, dissecting out again and uh, decompressing the nerve and another advantage which i feel is because of the narrow size of the endoscope similar to what uh, dr son has talked about uh, the uv technique also has a very, has got a very small endoscope size so these small endoscopes they are very very effective in causing decompression of the contralateral side with minimal complications and as compared to the microscope thank you very much thank you dr pramod yeah. uh i think uh, we have got a holistic view of uh, three systems which are established system in the uh, our uh, among spine surgeons uh, fraternity now i think uh, i'll be requesting dr uh, malcolm he will be speaking on setting up endoscopic spine practice and reducing learning curve this is another important topic how to go about most of the beginners they come for uh, training to us they ask ki sir kaise practice shuru kare kaun sa equipment kaise khareede initially financial issues are also there so i think uh, i'm sure dr malcolm will touch upon all these issues and uh, he will be dr malcolm please unmute yourself dr malcolm please unmute yourself i have unmuted him yeah thank you very much so over to dr malcolm please just in a bit in a second sir yeah sure loading then what uh, i think dr son there is even question from one of the uh, audience he is a dr navdeep dr uh, son are you audible yes 
or i think i will take questions later uh, dr malcolm is there yeah uh, good morning everybody uh, my talk is on how to set up endoscopic spine practice and reduce the learning curve before i start i would like to thank all my seniors dr ruidas dr mohit kaushal dr day dr monu singh and master son for giving me this opportunity dr pramod lokhande also thank you so much uh, basically my talk is not very scientific but it's more of a increasing your mental health now how do we set up an endoscopic spine practice the basic thing is you have to develop firstly the interest towards it what do i mean by saying that you develop an interest towards something basically you have to try and identify that what is going to be the minimally spine invasive branch that i really wish to invest in develop in before i jump to the next dr rohidas and dr mohinder kaushal and dr day they are the masters of destandu and arthur spine dio transforaminal is what dr lokande myself have developed posterior stenosis lumbar decompression as akin to again what is called as complete uh, posterior decompression what dr uh, lokande just spoke about and which i also do ub is a new technique relatively which i am also having my baby steps under the guidance of master son which i am very grateful for anterior cervical endoscopy is something also which we have developed now uh you have to identify your interest you have to learn you have to practice now i'm playing a small video maybe few seconds few minutes you can see here that i'm doing a posterior cervical decompression you can see how thick this flavor is because we are doing it under a fluid medium you can see that the fluid is actually dissecting away the flavor from the spinal cord the cervical cord and the flavor are separating out by themselves because very easy to pursue this and to carry out the decompression how do you pursue things you pursue things by attending workshops attending conferences following out the new trend of webinars follow on facebook groups dedicated to the teaching of these techniques ub korea is a group that is uh, headed by master son and which focuses mainly on ub technique and his work in endoscopy and infusion there are whatsapp groups supported by various mentors friends so please join all these groups see about the posts that are coming up try and analyze what your masters are trying to talk about and dedicate yourself to it now to learn a new philosophy you have to put aside some of your old concepts you have to try and understand the plus and minuses of any new technique i mean uh, a good friend of mine used to say there are many ways to skin a cat so you need to learn your techniques initial failure will occur conversion to open surgery may occur let it not deter you i mean it's happened to me my first two attempts at ub landed up in dural tear i had to open up and i had actually close so it it is not a setback it is it is a stepping stone to success set realistic goals this is what dr monu singh had stressed upon pick up easy cases pick up doable cases start with those that is what will take you further perseverance perseverance means never give up once you commit yourself to learning or mastering a new technique please persevere after that initial phase of exposure doing a couple of conferences attending a few workshops doing a few cadaveric things and doing a couple of cases you may tend to you know get disappointed of it let that not happen to you persistence is doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success don't give up think of what mahavir god buddha achieved he achieved nirvana through his effort i want to stress on all you young people who are listening today that you just can't give up you marrying a technique can't give up on a wife can't give up on your family same way you can't give up on endoscopic spine techniques single mindedness is to come in you have to eat dream sleep literally think endoscopy i think all of us masters here who are talking to you today believe me my open spine i think is just disappear off the shelf now i don't i don't think i remember doing a single open spine surgery in the last two years i even do my fusion through endoscopy through lyo for lysis for degenerative lysis you name it everything is being done today through endoscopy 
may be in fracture. Fair enough, endoscopy hasn't come in, and I will not go in that area itself. But in the degenerative spine, we literally eat, dream, sleep, think, talk endoscopy, and that is what you should persevere. To. For planning and execution, you are going to need an operation theater. You are going to need a motorized table, a CRM. You can see the tro video trolley behind. You need a video tower. You are going to need a radio frequency device. You are going to need a bird, which you saw how Dr. Lokande was using. And then depends upon your endoscopic system. Endoscopic system. If you are going to do the standu, you are going to need those kind of instruments. If you are going to do arthrospine, you are going to need those instruments. If you are going to do PLD or PSLD or UB, you are going to need that set of instruments. So these are the basic things that you're going to need when you want to set up an endoscopic spine practice. How do you reduce the learning curve, guys? There is only one mantra: have a good teacher. You are the best of the panelists today with you. You are each and every one capable of teaching you the best that you can learn in an endoscopic spine. Statistically, yes, seventy, eighty cases, but a good teacher, a good master, a good person who guides you. Can definitely help you flatten the curve. Like you know, we're talking about in Corona, social distancing, flattening the curve, guys. Same way, a good teacher is going to help you reduce your learning curve. So I'll end my talk by saying a big thank you to everyone and to all the panelists. Thank you very much, Dr. Malcolm. Thank you very much. I think it was a very brief, to the point, crisp message to youngsters. But I think uh, we will be, of course, during our uh, uh panel discussion will be talking with so many audis bmws marks in the market how a youngster should choose you all guys have become now five star guys and a youngster who is just going to start practice i think this question i'll be asking all the panelists but before we uh, get on to panel discussion i'll request dr uh, uh, rajmani rajmani he will be sharing uh, and talking about uh, radiation hazard in operation theater i think we are all guys we are doing Uh, very heroic surgeries, but radiation protection is very very important, which most of us overlook. And we, couple of our colleagues, colleagues have become casualties of uh, this radiation hazard. So may I request uh, Dr. Rajmani to share uh, and to enlighten us that how we can protect ourselves from this silent uh, monster who is there in the theater. And when surgeon is operating, he is under stress. He forgets that how many shots he has taken. Okay. So I think uh, Dr. Rajmani will. Surely, give us a little bit of uh, his uh, idea that how we can protect ourselves. Over to Dr. Rajmani. Yeah. Good afternoon to all, and all the youngsters are very interested in uh, uh, how to jump into the all the minimally invasive surgeries. But all of us forget how far we are assaulting ourselves, and so I talk. Uh, A little bit of radiation. How to protect yourself by performing these radiation surgeries? This is uh, all of us now interested or in doing a minimally invasive surgery, whether we need a microscope or arthro or with full endoscopy or using implants for minimally invasive surgeries. But so it is in spine surgery today. Any minimally invasive surgery, especially, is inevitably to use uh, fluoroscopy because. A precise localization is very very important because if somebody asks me what are the complications of spine surgery, I will say any spine surgery, whether open or endoscopy. I will say the complication is wrong level, wrong level, wrong level. That is the commonest uh, complications you get it, and so a precise localization is very very important. And for that, you need a fluoroscopy. So it is how to protect yourself first. So. Basically, we say it is a one-minute surgery. It's a simple disc. I'll come out in 40 minutes. After that, I'm going to do the fluoroscopy one minute. So I need not use an ambulance. But it's common attitude for youngsters, or even for sometimes for seniors, for some of us. But mind it, one minute exposure of fluoroscopy is equal to 150 chest X-rays. That much of radiation you get when you expose yourself for one minute fluoroscopy. So I stress for whether seniors or juniors, whoever it is, better have a shield. Don't go to the hall without any armament. Armament apart from instrumentation, these are all the other armamentoriums you need to protect yourself. Eyeglasses for eye protection, thyroid protection for thyroid, and aprons for chest and abdomen. 
and even you have a net screen possible to have a safety of the anesthetics and other paramedical workers. And now basically it's very important how you position the CM. That is very, very important. Better keep the CM tube opposite sides because you are going to expose the patient in a lesser view or under the table if you are going to take and expose the AP view for the patient. Because it is very much essential to keep this very important because it is to reduce direct exposure of scattered irradiation. This scattered irradiation comes in a language, not stated. So probably those who stand on the sites will be more affected. And as a surgeon, you stand on the sites, not from the between the directly over the tube. So it is very mandatory to keep the X-ray on opposite side to avoid the scattered irradiation. Then another important thing, this is the common word now we come across social, social, social distancing. Here also it is very important how you distance yourself. Rajmani, your voice is not very clear. Can you do something about your voice? Are you are you able to hear now? Uh, Dr. Dr. Shok, how can his uh, voice be become more clear or better in quality? Are you, are you able to hear now? I, I can hear that's better. That's better. Yeah. I can hear him better. Okay, so, okay, okay. Yeah, now I think please carry on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, that's the important thing is distancing. It's very, very important as on today because of Corona, everybody insists social distancing. Now, as a surgeon, we must know how to distance from the CM. Especially, you keep 60 centimeters away at least from the source and all the assistant, if possible, six meters, it is six feet, it is not possible. So, three feet is away for the assistant, it is always better. But you can't keep away for avoiding a hand exposure because you can't use a glove, something like an aerial use. So to avoid that, you always use long-handled instruments, needles and wires when you localize. Then fluoroscopy, the how to reduce the dose. Always try to instruct your technician to have a low dosage, pulsed images and spot imaging and intermittent fluoro with a last image hold. These are all the things will reduce the amount of radiation exposure but one major disadvantage on the, all these things is the poor quality of the images which you get. Probably you may get the poor interpretation. And then ask your technician to be early, to start early, let him collimate. So that when the radiation view, the window is so narrow, so you don't get an exposure on the sides. So don't you go wash up and then once positioning the table, having the markers there, and then instead of asking the technician to start, ask the technician first to collimate and sensing the image, which will reduce the irradiation. As I told you, when you adopt all these techniques to reduce the radiation which you use, the surgeon's image quality will be very poor. How to interpret with the image poor quality? Of course, you should not compromise on this, but when you work out with the X-ray, when you work out with the MRI, probably you will be able to guess how to locate L5 and S1. Because S1 will be cone shaped sometimes in a super memory vertebrae or lumberization or sacralization. These are all the common difficulties, even for experienced surgeon on the table to identify L5 S1. So these things you can work out on an X-ray. And another thing it will help you is to easily localize, in spite of having a poor quality image, you need not spend more time on that. Of course, the next is to use other alternatives, isocentric CDC arms, O arms, and MRI for intraoperative. Of course, these are all the things that may not be necessary for a simple disc surgery. But in future, when the same surgeon is going to use a minimally invasive instrumentation and all, probably this will come in handy. Next, these are all the important things which one surgeon has to look into it before washing up or learning the technique. And then another thing comes because in addition to that, Mohinder asked me to touch upon economical factors on these uh, minimal invasive surgeries as long as this is concerned. Whether it is economical to the patient or economical to the surgeon. Of course, it is economical to the patient because they daycare surgery. Because in those days, they used to say, come morning and then go, come today, go to the next day. But here, still more we are advanced, come in the morning, go in the evening. So in that way, it is definitely economical to the patient. But how far it is economical to the surgeon? Because in the corporate sector, where you, the, the institution is going to buy instruments for you, it is no problem. But as an individual, if you're going to have a setup, you have to think about the cost of the instruments, what you need. Whatever surgery you do, 
it is your choice and your selection whether it is tendu or posterior full endoscopy or transforaminal or ube whatever it is this tendu i feel is of all these system the minimal instruments that is necessary for this is distant system and in no way it is different from what you see the anatomy through your open surgery which you are used to through earlier or when you are going to use through the microscope the same field same perception you are going to have only thing is instrumentation and uh, uh, these smaller incision that matters so non road is always better it doesn't mean you don't need to embark on a transforaminal or uh, arthrospine or ube but all these things you can go on add a component to that if your economic your pocket uh, sounds that so with that i think with the minimal precautions how to protect there's a lot of things we can talk about but i am use i am just to mention just to remind that you should concentrate on this also apart from uh, your technical aspect thank you thank you one and all for listening and then thank you all for the faculties thank you mohinder thank you dr rajmani for uh, sticking to time in fact a good good news from uh, dr ashok is that he has extended our uh, session half an hour more means till 2:30 we can carry on now our panel discussion i think uh, first uh, i will uh, uh, have one question which is from one of our colleagues from chandigarh to dr son is dr son uh, can i have dr son i think he is uh, kaise i can see you can i have dr son on uh, hey, dr kausa i'm sorry dr son went to um, for natural call so he'll be back soon okay so fine no problem so uh, i think what i now uh, i think about principles uh, dr pramod will you like to add anything about principles because i firmly believe if you follow the principles correctly i think the journey becomes very very uh, uh, comfortable and many many minimum bumps are there dr pramod but what are the principles unmute yourself okay uh, thank you dr kaushal uh, first of all i would like to say there is a difference between concepts and technique concepts have remained the same i think over the years they have uh, they have not changed whatever is there inside the canal that has to be approached by the interlaminar approach is going through the interlaminar space and whatever pathology is lying outside the spinal canal that is in the foramen or the extra foramenal space that has to be gone through the outside of the foramen maybe it's a cambens triangle whatever name you use it depending on the technique you use so this concept is the same all over the world and uh, i think unless you master both these techniques together like you can't call your, yourself as as a destandu technique a tech uh, destandu surgeon if you are doing only interlaminar approach with the help of a destandu instrumentation and if there is a foramenal or extra foramenal disc i have a question isn't it so i have a question yeah this is what we are uh, supposed to yeah. learn here the concepts of the spinal surgery they remain the same dr rohidas let him finish then you yeah yeah, yeah. just i'm waiting for okay yeah i think that's it uh i think principles remain the same as uh, dr uh, pramod has emphasized let's let's listen to dr rohidas what he has to uh, say no why it is not possible to target the cambian stangle interlaminar interlaminar means you are going posteriorly if you go posteriorly and target isthmus you are in the foramen you don't have to go far away and reach the foramen far lateral so in interlaminar means the posterior approach you are able to target the far lateral disc extra foramenal disc just lateral to the isthmus yeah. your targeting area is not lamina it is the isthmus i think so you have uh, to understand the anatomy uh, i think uh, this is a uh, established fact that most of procedure surgeons whether they are open surgeons or they are microscopic or endoscopic they land in that area only where uh, dr rohidas has said outside the isthmus and that is a uh, fact i think that's a known thing whereas uh, 
I think transhumanic is a different philosophy altogether. And uh, yes, transhumanic, you just land there, but here also, uh, from posteriorly also, you can approach that uh, area or campaign strangle. What so, uh, by posteriorly, to approach the foramen also. That is what I'm just no. Just any uh, anything? Uh, any of my colleagues wants to add anything more in this? Yeah, I would like okay. to say a few words. Uh, first of all, if you look at the foramen, anatomy of the foramen, if uh, it has been very well uh, mentioned in Macnab, which is one of the ba most basic uh, textbooks in spine surgery, that foramen <laughs> and extra foramenal region they lie outside, they lie lateral uh, to the pedicle, and uh, whereas. Uh, uh, except the L5-S1 level where you can approach the foramen through the interlaminar space. Whereas at all the levels except L5-S1, we have to approach the foramen from the outside. That is the Wiltshire approach or a transforamal approach, whatever it is. So this, uh, unless you remove the facet, unless you do a... In you are not approaching facet at all. You are at the isthmus. You are lateral and superior to the facet. So unless you damage the isthmus, I don't think you'll be able to reach the foramen through the interlaminar space. No, you have to I, cut the I, part I, of the isthmus. You are not damaging the facet at all. Can I interrupt? Yeah, you see, yes, on model, yes, highlight. Yeah, yeah, just to educate us more on model, yeah. So, uh, Pramod, you are here, here in the uh, interlamina, and uh, in the uh, interlamin area, you are doing everything. But if it is a extra foraminal, you have just uh, lodged the instrument here, just 5 to 10 millimeter or say 7, 8 millimeter above and maybe 5 millimeter later. And then here you will get the uh, extra foraminal area. You uh, may not touch the lamina, may not touch the, uh, this is the descending uh, facet, only you have to touch the ascending facet laterally. And then you can decompress here, remove the disc here and uh, everything is in front of you. Uh, just uh, you are putting the uh, targeting the structure in the laminar here. You're just talking five millimeter about the aspect of the facet, isn't it? Keep, keep the model. Uh, I think uh, PC, PC you have beautifully the demonstrated. Yeah. Oh, I think, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Malcolm, uh, would you like to come in? Sir, uh, yeah, I think I'm on you. Sir, you just, just have a, going there, just have a look at the screen. It is the isthmus now on the screen. Uh, no, we are not able to see the screen. I have shared my this thing. Yeah, I think uh, so, Dr. No, we are not able to see your screen. I think oh, on yeah. model, lift the model more. Lift the model. Yeah, it is very clear here. It is interlaminar and it is the. Uh, yeah, yeah. We understood. We understood that. Just uh, five millimeter lateral and five millimeter above. I think so more the, to I think, uh, very clear and they target the target the isthmus, yeah. target the extra foraminal area. Don't go to the interlaminar area. Today we got the point. We got the point. Uh, Pramod, you like yeah. to come in, Pramod? Yeah, that is what I was telling. That uh, you are putting, you are telling the same message which I am telling in different words. You are going lateral to the face, lateral border of the isthmus, which is similar to a transformal approach. So Only same, you can reach posteriorly. Is, that is what Pramod, I yes. was telling you. The inter I'm, interlaminar approach is something which is in between the interlaminar space. It is in the interlaminar space. That is the interlaminar okay. approach. And no, don't, don't, using, don't, uh, don't confuse approach. the word. If I may just interrupt. Ha, Malcolm, I, then Dr. Son. After Malcolm, Dr. Son. Yeah. Master okay. Son will also agree that, and I also agree with Noida sir. I agree with Pramod also. We are now in posterior endoscopy developing the para UV, the para PSLD approach, and thereby limiting the role of transforaminal per se. But as far as let us say a thoracic disc, central thoracic disc is concerned, there can be no substitution to that than a transforaminal approach. So there are the indications, the area of role of the transforaminal is becoming restricted by the development of the para approaches. I think Master Son is an expert in para UV approach and he will confirm what I'm trying to say. Okay, even for a lateral disc, we land on the isthmus, we go lateral to it, and we go to the disc. Now, oh, great. Dr. That's great. Dr. Son, please. Dr. Son. We are, we, are, we are playing with the words interlaminar, yes, foraminal. Interlaminar is posterior, <laughs> foraminal is lateral. We are playing with fluid based, air based, pure endoscopic, endoscopic assisted. The, don't sir, we are all endoscopic. We are all endoscopic. Sir, there is no difference. 
you are don't give youngster the message he should choose what is he is very good at it dr son dr son okay please. my time please my time yeah. <laughs> i th i think the first anatomy is very first important because first uh, you know that i i think my opinion foraminal divided three divisions so ganglion inside the ganglion medial side posterior approach contralateral easy ganglion outside outside the paraspinal approach more easy that means here endoscope can do can up can go contralateral but ganglion inside is very easy but ganglion outside paraspinal approach more easy i think yes Yes, I agree with you completely. Other, other. So, uh, what what I need to what I need to understand is that you are using a particular instrumentation set. Using that particular set, those instruments, how easy is it to convert in between an interlaminar and a paraspinal uh, approach? Where do you think these basic instrumentation stand vis-a-vis -vis, uh, against? Each other. Let's talk about the UV, the descendu, the posterior interlamina that uh, uh, Pramod is doing. So, uh, what is your take? What would be an instrumentation system which can address these uh, three uh, uh, points together? Uh, if I could have the opportunity to answer, I would say UV is one of the most versatile systems today because you have a four millimeter scope. Therefore, the contralateral decompression, which Doctor Master Son was talking of, is very easy. For an extra foraminal disc, now Master Son has developed the para PSLD approach, and akin to or almost similar to Destandu is the interlaminar approach using UV instruments. So therefore, UV is the future. I feel personally, Dr. Rohidas may may not agree. Four mm scope is very good for visualization of the anatomy, and if you use a zero degree scope, the anatomy is much better. Because it is in non. What I meant is four millimeter diameter. Yes. And degree of view is zero degree. I agree with you, sir. Absolutely agree, sir. No, uh, when we are talking about the versatility of the equipment, the same set of equipment, one should not expect the person to end up having different different sets for working. Let us say one particular set of equipment you are supposed to have, and how versatile that particular set is, so that you can manage most of the conditions. When we are talking about the degenerative lumbar spine. Or the lumbar spine per se itself. Then we are talking about the degenerative conditions. We are talking about the stenotic conditions. We are also talking about far lateral uh, uh, stenotic uh, lesions. So, yes, how, how, how would you grade these systems? And it's not just the the advantages. Can we have a few words on particular scenario where they are not at a very good advantage? Uh, Monu sir, I will so, answer. I will answer you this way that in my own personal learning curve, I started with microendoscopic discectomy, which most of all of us have started with. Then I started with the Destando system, and subsequently I learned transforaminal, but I found transforaminal falling short in many areas, causing a lot of root dysesthesias, sometimes root paralysis. So I felt that I needed a better option. So I initially picked up Master Doctor Master uh, Doctor Lim's technique of PSLD. Now in PSLD we are using a thicker scope, so akin to that what Doctor uh, Pramod Lokhande uses. How, how much is the diameter of the scope? Lim scope. Master. How much is the diameter of Lim scope? A Lim scope is around 9.8 or almost 10 millimeters wide, and a working channel is almost 6 millimeters. While Pramod uses a 8 millimeter scope with a working channel which is 5.5. So the marginal difference is over there, sir. But the big issue here is that you are not having independent hand movement. You are working through the scope. So there is no question of triangulation. It becomes very easy when you are switching over a technique. But if you go to a master technique or a better technique, I will say it is finally UB because it's a free hand technique. A four millimeter scope moves very easily within the spinal canal. Less chance of damage. Less chance of any, you know. Um, mishandling pramod may may not agree uh just a few words on that uh, first of all i think uh, when we say a master technique i think a person who is most conversant with any technique which he is using i think that is a master that is, that is master technique uh, that is that <laughs> but uh, if you talk about uh, ube and full endoscopy i personally feel that ube 
uh, has a little more advantage uh, in two things. First of all, it is slightly faster, cheaper equipment, very, easy, very uh, you know, inexpensive. You can use the same sets which are using for open yes. surgery. The contralateral decompression is very well done with the uh, UBE. But if you look at other drawbacks of UB, which I feel is that, for example, if you have a simple paracentral disc herniation at L5-S1, you're doing the same thing. You're uh, you know, drilling the superior lamina. You have to remove the, resect the entire uh, flavum on the, uh, on, on, the, on the ipsilateral side. And uh, uh, this is, I think, a little bit more aggressive. Whereas if you come with, with you. the interlaminar technique or a transformal technique, uh, you just make a small slit in the ligamentum flavum. You don't have to cut any bone. You don't have to remove anything. Oh, it's exactly what is but, but, what minimally invasive spine surgery is. If you look at the basic principle of minimally invasive spine surgery, you have to resect as less bone as possible. You have to remove as less soft tissue as possible. True. So whatever technique is able to achieve this, I think that is one of the best techniques we can do. No, no, basic, uh, basic, we are, we are in minimal, while chasing for the minimalism, we should not be inadequate at the root decompression. No, we are not talking of inadequacy because uh, all these techniques are perfectly adequate and it has been proven wo worldwide by a lot of uh, famous surgeons everywhere. I think unless they have been uh, very well, they are, they are not being propagated, they, are, they have not been accepted. Worldwide. Dr. Son, you wanted to come in? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I I am UB surgeon, but many surgeons, PSLD, PEID surgeon, but the key key point to approach contralaterally, oh, uh, you mentioned uh, four millimeter, five millimeter, not important because here the base of spinous process drilling is more important. That means here, if you four millimeter approach angle is high, but this is after drilling out base of spinous more vertical, more easy go to contralateral. That means here, I think U, ULBD, at ULBD, the key point is to drill at base of spinous process. I think after drilling base of spinous process, you can go contralateral easy, you can go upside, downside easy. That means that, that is anatomy and physics, I think. Yes, I agree. I agree with that. And what we are we are we are just always theoretically discussing is the size of the incision in millimeters. So we have really clear what we do at the site of the pathology. It is very important. I think if it is the instrument is all relative, sir. Not instrument incision, size of the incision. Okay, incision yes, sure. only is all relative, sir. Yes, sir, we, I think uh, 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 meaning, sir. Uh, yeah. I think uh, Mohinder, one bird, one bird. Yeah. Whether the size of the incision and then how much of instruments, it all depends. You know, the bulk system is minimal instruments, one maximum. And whether it is the same steps are equal, known role is always better. After all, the patient wants a relief. If you are going to give the results for the patient, your system is the best. That's what I say. That's why at the Perfect. end, at the I, I, when I finished my presentation, I told you about the diamond standard, not the gold. Yeah. <laughs> Surgeon should be satisfied what he has done. Yeah. First, so many times it happens that we are satisfied as a surgeon, the patient is not happy. He is not satisfied. The patient is happy with your system and what you feel as a surgeon, that is the best. Surgeon should be satisfied, the uh, yeah. patient should be satisfied, and his pain has to be less as compared to the post op. Yes. Uh, Dr. Son, there is a question to you from one of our colleagues. He wants to know what is the difference between Sohn's space and multi fidus triangle. Yes, yes. Sohn's mean, okay, commonly we think we, when you read the MRI, so here, lamina and multi fidus here, fatty shear here, but uh, we commonly work, but not important, but in UBE, you can go first at first at there. At there, so at, that means here. You can means, show you can show the slide if you wish to. If you have a laptop open with you, we can share the uh, the screen. Yeah, you can screen share. In the meantime, shall I put a word on that, Mohinder? Yeah. 
Yes. If you put the word in the meantime, he gets ready. You know, the paraspinal muscle, the attachment is opposite to the inferior mm -hmm. order. Mm -hmm. The septa there. Once you mini this inside the septa, opposite to the laminar surface, is no attachment at all. So you can go in between the muscle, between the spinous process and this one. And the yeah, that is the most space. vascular area and the least damage to the muscles. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That is what they call that as a zone triangle or uh, show. Multifid. Yeah, Dr. Son, if you can show it us on the screen, yeah. that would be much better. Please, full, please. Full, 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 full. Okay. Meantime, by the time his uh, son comes on the screen, I just want to share ki all these systems which we are talking about, they're all mobile. But I think the maximum mobility is with the uh, Dr. Son's technique. And maybe the world is uh, moving towards that. But I think every system, whichever system you learn, you become comfortable, I think, and you can give best results. That is your, uh, that should be your mecca rather than uh, sh shifting from one to another, better. You, these all techniques are not established technique. They are successful techniques. Surgeon has to master one technique. If guy is driving your Audi today, BMW tomorrow, and after marks, I think he is going to create problems. So better stick to one of the brands and master that brand. Which brand? That is call of a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you, you, surgeon has to follow one technique. In the meantime, there, I have a question, and this pertains specifically to Dr. Mahinda and uh, Pramod. See, um, we are doing guy endoscopies, we are doing fluid-based endoscopies, and uh, Dr. Mahinda has also modified its system to include a fluid-based endoscopic procedure. And where, where do we stand with the medium? What do you feel? What should be the... Uh, at the, the correct, the ideal medium to use and in which situations that would be able to feel a dry endoscopy is better than a wet one or vice versa. Few expert comments on this. Dr. Rohidas, please. But you don't confuse in between the fluid medium and dry medium. Which method you are comfortable, follow it. In fluid, Lokhande just mentioned that there is absolutely no bleeding. This is because of irrigation. There is a bleeding, but you keep the irrigating fluid in such a way that you think that it is a bloodless field. Still, there is a bleeding from the bone and the muscle. You have to use RF. You have to use the cautery. In dry, you have to keep the medium, the, the, the field as less bloody as possible. You have to do hemostasis and you have to use various methods. So for each medium, you have to follow their basic principles. Dr. Son, yeah, yeah. Dr. Son, yeah. you screen, yeah. Okay, this one. Uh, okay, the sound space is very important in to make initial working space. You can see here, multipedus, no, muscle, paraspinal muscle, lamina here. This one, potentials of here, some pet tissue connected in a vessel, this one, Normally, initially, this is just a potential space, but we can check in, we can check in pre-operative MRI. This size is important. Also, sometimes big size or small size, but, come. but we call this one, first we call this one the some space. And next, after detaching here, this potential space, converted to working space. So in pre-operative MRI, this space is very important. You recognize the size and tissue and sometimes the bone is per abnormality. So I think, so this is the sound space and this one initial working space. So that means here, today my lecture is the beginners have a difficulty to make initial working space. So I might, my lecture's key is how to make working space. So this one, scope, penetrate, sleeve technique, and hydrosperger and retractor. These all to make initial working space. So, and that means here, this one here, 
this one here, spinach, uh, spinach processor and here muscle, just a small package here. This is the sonju space. So first the pre-operate MRI, check here, this one, and also checking and working, initial working space, and here, drilling. Drilling this one lamina. After then, after drilling bone lamina, the next step, same as open surgery, the other techniques, I think. Can I ask a question for Dr. Son? Yes, yes Dr. Rohidas, please. Dr. Son. Yeah. Now, so many students have come to you and you mentioned that in initial cases, there is a tendency to go to the opposite side rather than the ipsilateral side. My presentation. Yeah. Have you experienced this thing in new, daily, new surgeons who have just started the UBE? Yeah. Contralateral side, okay, this one here. No. Rather than approaching the ipsilateral side, you start going on the opposite side. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Starting point here. Yes. Starting so point in here. Initial okay. stages, is yeah, there yeah. any possibility of making mistakes? Yeah. Mike. To prevent the to prevent the complication and joint violation to prevent the initial starting point is important here. This one. This is a spinal process and lamina and here. Junctional here, starting point here, drilling here. This one here, uh, button is uh, lamina, top is uh, spinal process. This is junction area, drilling starting here. So this is, so, this is please, please, this is key. And this one, ipsilateral. This one, this one, midline cleft, ipsilateral, <coughs> and contralateral, this one. This view is uh, after drilling out base of its brain processor. Yeah, so really you can go contralateral easily. That means here, again, drilling starting point, second drilling of base of its brain processor. After then, you can go easily contralaterally. Very simple. This is anatomy, only anatomy, physics. So you, uh, do, you, you, target from, you target from the midline and identify the midline yeah. in between the flavum. Okay, yeah. Midline also, midline is midline cleft here, become the flavum. Yeah. One question uh, to Sean. Would you like to keep the patient in canal stenosis? Do you like to keep the spine in lordosis or in extension? Extension or extension? Please, please, again, please. What right. position of the spine you do? You maintain when you do a canal stenosis. Keep the spine in neutral, flexion or extension. Positioning. Please, Malcolm, please, Malcolm, please again, please. I think uh, Rajmani, 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 I will put, I will put you. Wait, wait. Rajmani, wait. Doctor, oh, Sam, okay. Anybody? The position of the spine, whether you do interspinous distraction or the lordosis is kept as it is. So okay, Lord, okay. Lordosis yeah, yeah. is kept as it is. We use normal oh, process. You cast, you cast in your position, okay? Position, okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I recommend you, I always, uh, in microsurgery, slightly kypotic, using Wilson frame to widen interamina space, but in UB, neutral position important, I think. Kypotic posture make more epidural bleeding. So, I recommend you just a neutral position. Yeah. Okay. That great. That yeah, answers, because... I think, uh, Rajmani's questions. I think uh, we have still uh, about uh, 10 minutes to go. And uh, I'll uh, now, I think, let's talk about a little bit about patient counseling. Can Dr. Uh, PC Day share his uh, thoughts ki when he is counseling patient about? Uh, endoscopic spine surgeries, what uh, points he tries to mm -hmm. discuss with the patient and what message he will like to give to the youngsters. Dr. PC, please. So about the endoscopic spine surgery, if you are talking to the patient. Mohinder, 
then you yeah. are very clear from your doctor ortel is there i'll just ask him whether he can join ortel we can have his comments yeah we yeah, can yeah, yeah, just for the comments yeah, yeah. he can do yeah. an expert panel i i'll just try for him but do you have his email id you have to wait, share wait, his email wait. id to dr ashok wait wait let him you have to share that uh, id also with him i am i am sharing his link the link okay he, he can join by phone also if you can send him yeah, a yeah, whatsapp yeah yeah just wait just wait <coughs> it's only 10 minutes more it's okay dr pc okay. you please carry on so this is the uh, uh, thing that uh, what we should uh, convey our juniors colleague that how to uh, convince this uh, or how to give your uh, thoughts about this endoscopic technique or microendoscopic technique or mises technique to the patient before surgery so this is the uh, whole talk uh, i am going to uh, tell you in brief about in a minute that uh, patient should be clear about your thought that this is my technique and this is the way i am doing it and i am going with that same way that internal minor and i am going to deal with the same pathology without disturbing the structures more and without disturbing the stability so that the patient uh, it should be convinced that neural damage neural or, or infection complication will be very less and also you can deal with the pathology of the same side or opposite side as per the need as per the principle as per the uh, requirement of the patient without disturbing the function or without disturbing the stability and limiting the complications at the same time you can finish it with the uh, less time less bleeding and the patients uh, go to the his uh, day to day work uh, very faster and, and also the cosmetic ways so all these things at the same time you will get uh, the less costly because we need maybe sometime three four level also the surgery can be done in this technique uh, this endoscopic technique but uh, without disturbing the anatomy so stabilization is not necessary also sometime after the surgery so maybe after 7 years 8 years there may be recurrence of the stenosis or maybe adjacent level pathology that if you you fix it one level then there is a uh, the mobility of the adjacent level that leads to the pathology more how much pc uh, how much information you share with patients about uh neurological complications i mean uh, concern their concerns are at times they come and ask you doctor sahab ka niche ka hissa reh to nahi jayega phulane ka operation hua tha he lost his control of flex so how do you counsel that area i mean purpose is not to scare him away but how you address that issue where patient is quite skeptical he has a problem he wants surgery to be done but he is worried that i may lose his control control of flex i think uh, doctor uh, pc and after that we'll like to have comments from dr son and then dr hidas in that order about the neurological injury or neurological deficit during this surgery so you can compare the statistics you can take the statistics and convey to the patient that if you go for the open surgery maybe it is 1 to 2% patient is not interested in statistics just ask patient is sitting next to you what you tell him so he paralysis hoga ya nahi hoga what you tell him so it is a magnified view well illuminated view and uh, you cannot injure the nerve because you have the protection also Hello, so great thank you cannot. thank you dr son please you like to come in how you counsel your patients they have what very neurological injury whether there will be any neurological complications of surgery how do you counsel the patient and how do you address his concern about this complication neurological complications Okay, uh, you okay? Your your question is uh, if the surgery due to complication. Yeah. Okay. After the surgery, after surgery. Also, I I I yeah. think I think uh, the pre-operative uh, uh, patient interview is very important. But you know yeah. that patient uh, if patient has hernia uh, disc or a stenosis, patient have uh, some. Uh, some uh, injured uh, root symptom root so damaged root so uh, i recommend i interview with my uh, patient uh, after the surgery you also symptom is remain remain uh, but after the surgery you symptom is uh, improved slow and slowly so that means after the surgery i also that means after the surgery interview not important pre operative important very important i think Yeah, Dr. Rohit Das, please. 
that's why the spine surgery is defamed surgery first i told you surgeon has to be satisfied what he has done at the site of the pathology whether he is happy with the root decompression whether he is happy with the adequacy of the discectomy and he should be able to convince that to the patient and that's why i showed you one one uh, this thing a uh, slide of intra operative training here the training of the patient's relative comes i show the surgery full surgery to the patient's relative he is explained what is the nerve root how it is compressed how it is decompressed how much disc has to be removed how much is kept inside and rest he accepts the recovery how the root is going to recover dr rohit das post operative patient was neurologically intact before uh, endoscopy post operative patient has a foot drop because we have screwed his uh, l5 nerve root now But, how you will uh, convince this patient tell me no no during surgery when the relative is looking at the surgery he will be able to know what i have done i don't have to hide anything how you how you convince that patient of disability post operatively is in spite of that not having any injury during the surgery and if there is any problem <coughs> sorry patient relate you and patient accept that so thank you very much i think uh, we had a very fruitful discussion and uh, as the <coughs> session is coming to an end few points i think uh, as far as patient counseling is concerned we should address his realistic requirements so what exactly result or what results we can offer to the patient we can't promise him a moon, moon. and we should have a realistic expectations relative versus back pain and leg pain how much back pain relief will be there how much leg pain relief will be there these are the questions which patient usually ask us in our outpatient department and they ask us why not open surgery why endoscopy i think now since endoscopy is established as a specialty so these questions are not asked to that extent and just to share i think all panelists they will agree with me that mic is a gratifying uh, endoscopic mic procedure are very very gratifying they are like uh, playing a video game but initial learning curve is very very steep surgeon should be prepared for longer over times i remember first case when i did of endospine in 2002 it was i took about 2 and 1/2 to 3 hours now i am done in about 20 to 30 minutes so initially there are financial issues also but once the technique is mas mastered i think there are improved clinical outcomes there is increased footfall of the patients and uh, better growth avenues as far as financial finances are concerned and take away message would be from all of us i think if you want to learn these techniques first you should be convinced ki which particular technique you want to learn and master and you must visit that surgeon who is master in that technique spend few days and weeks with him a short term fellowship will be a very good idea then you attend certain cadaveric workshops to build up your confidence and once you have learned cadaveric workshops then probably you can do a first case in your ot with all your backup plans that if you are not able to complete the procedure endoscopically you must be mentally prepared to convert it to open and with that uh, concluding remarks i thank all the panelists uh, ortho tv and uh, of course world endoscopic spine society that uh, this uh, webinar has gone successfully this was first of our series and i think uh, it was a very good show the picture quality was video quality was excellent and views of uh, panelists were uh, uh, exchanged and i am sure soon we will have a, another uh, webinar i think any comments from uh, stalwarts dr rohidas you would like to conclude before i hand over the uh, 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 the mike to our dr ashok who is the web master we, we, we should thank uh, dr ashok this is post corona world and we will have to repeat these these uh, type of webinars as frequently as possible yeah i think we are very happy that he is one of our fraternity and he is uh, usually he is in this field from last i think 4 5 years i saw him the way things have picked up and become popular and i think uh, this is a way forward to share the knowledge among the world fraternity and uh, dr ashok thank you very much for your uh, you. cooperation and i think this was a complimentary first web uh, 
uh, webinar from his side, but surely soon we will be contributing financially also to him so that we are able to get these kind of uh, webinars in coming times also. Is this, Dr. Ashok, is this, is this whole conversation recorded? Yeah, till and now, you yes. And see afterwards, have a look at it afterwards. Yes, yes, perfect. Thank you, thank you, thank you. One more, uh, one thank, more. You, thank you, panelists, thank you very much. Over to Dr. Ashok. Thank you very much. Dr. Rajmani wants to say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But probably next webinars we can have uh, some case discussion. One man can have a case Fine with wine, holding a oh, wine. Yeah. Dr. Ashok, you can stop <laughs> live streaming if panelists want to. Yeah, have yes, fine. Yeah, sure. So I think that will be a good idea.